Let's go to work. Greetings, we are in junior English, and today our interest is to introduce you to the great American poet Emily Dickinson. She is a contemporary of Emerson, of Thoreau, of Whitman, no doubt. She's a contemporary of all of those guys. Uh, she's got an interesting biography, and that's where we've got to start. The work of Emily Dickinson is very difficult to understand without understanding, first of all, Emily Dickinson. Now, I know you've already listened to a lecture on Emily Dickinson, but I want to amplify in some of these major points. Let's begin, first of all, by pointing out that Dickinson all of her life is what we would call agoraphobic. That is to say, she does not like to come out in public. She spends the majority of her life within the uh, mansion, we would call it today a mansion, the large house that her father will provide for her and his family. She will spend the majority of her time in that house in her bedroom or in the large garden in the backyard. When parties were had at the Dickinson house, and it happened periodically, Emily rarely was seen. She might be sighted briefly, leaving, for example, from her bedroom and returning back to her bedroom. At her death, there were large numbers of bundles of paper that had been neatly tied together in ribbon. They almost threw this stuff away, found under the bed, found in boxes, in the closets, etc. All over her room, there are these piles of these, these letters. Uh, that's what they thought they were, letters. Uh, and the handwriting was nigh illegible. It took a while to figure out that all of these slips of paper, the back of an envelope, a piece of uh, pa butcher paper that the uh, grocer had brought some meat in, that kind of thing, torn small pieces. Well, what do you know? These are all lines of poetry, thousands and thousands of lines of poetry, thousands of poems. Emily herself published almost none of this stuff in her lifetime and rarely even spoke of it. To that degree, she dies leaving behind a large collection of lines of poetry. This is important for your notes. She never commented on any of these poems. Unlike Whitman, now I'm already helping you, aren't I, with the paper that you're to write for tomorrow, a comparative analysis between Whitman and Dickinson. Unlike Whitman, Dickinson wrote all her life but never talked about her poems, never left behind any kind of notes to try to explain what was going on. Dickinson would write her poetry and then die, and then it would be left up to scholars. And it took a while for scholars to come to realize just how important her poetic voice was, for reasons we'll get into in a moment. By the middle of the 20th century, the 1950s for sure, Dickinson had been accorded a very special place in the pantheon of great American writers, considered one of the top five most important writers, backslash poets, of the American literary tradition. That's really ironic, given that when she dies, she is virtually an unknown writer during her time. That is another difference between she and Whitman. Whitman, of course, is very popular in 1892 when he dies. Everyone pretty much knows who he is. Everybody pretty much knows who Emerson and who Thoreau are. Not so much Emily Dickinson. <clears throat> it's long after the fact that people will begin to look at these poems and recognize these poems as being significant contributions. Why? Two reasons. Let's list them. One, very much like Whitman, she is very experimental in regards to form. Students will often look at poems lying on the page, assume about them because they are so, so short, what? They're going to be very what? They're going to be very easy to read. Dude, this is going to be like cakewalk. I'll have my annotations done in no time reading the poems of Emily Dickinson and then get to the end of the third line and go, whoa, 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 what am I reading? For example, look on 529, just a classic example. Much madness is divinest sense. I mean, you ought to have a book open right now and be looking with me. Let's go. 529, much madness is divinest sense. You look at this poem lying there on the page, your first instincts are, dude, how hard can it be? I mean, it's almost not even legitimate to call this a poem. Look how simple it looks. And yet we start reading. Much madness is divinest sense to a discerning eye. Much sense, the starkest madness. 
tis the majority in this is all prevailed. Assent, and you are sane. Demure, you're straightway dangerous and handled with a chain. And it's usually for juniors right about this time when the junior reader will say, what did I just read? Now, this is ironic because with the exception of maybe the word assent and demure, all the other words in this poem are pretty simple vocab words. And yet, some of you are scanning this poem again to try to figure out what in heaven's name is it she's saying. This is what we mean by experimental. One of the things let's point out right away on 529 in this much madness is divine sense. What punctuation mark is most used in this poem? Jot it down in your notes. We're working it to be, aren't we? Not what the poet says, but how the poet says it. What is the mark that's most used in this poem? What will we call it? You'll call it the dash or the hyphen, won't you? Notice over and over again, we got this long hyphen or dash that's being used over and over again. Put it in your notes. Dickinson loved to use this dash. Now, there is some debate whether Emily Dickinson herself thought that she was writing poetry. There is some debate about this. There are some people who think that these may have just been uh, random experiments with language that she herself was not really necessarily creating quote unquote a poem in the same genre as Longfellow's long, uh, Song of Life, Tell Me Not in Mournful Numbers, Life is But an Empty Dream. One of the reasons why some scholars believe this is she never titled any of her poems, which is why when you pick up a folio of the some 1500 of her poems, you usually will find that the title is the, is the first line of the poem. Notice it. Success is counted sweetest. Much madness is divine ascents. My life goes twice before it's closed. In other words, whatever was the first line of the poem became the title of the poem for scholars who started a folio and put this stuff together in the form of books. What we need to point out about form is that she's very experimental, very short. Her lines are often going to be cut off with these dashes. And they require a reading and then a rereading and then to go back and read again. The problem for us is that we have no record of what she was talking about a lot of times. Journals where she might say, I was thinking about this when I wrote that. And then we have some sense of how to try and piece it all together. Let's say it for your notes. Reading the poetry of Emily Dickinson is like reading a puzzle where you're not always exactly sure what the ultimate meaning of the poem is you're kind of guessing at it a lot of times. Now notice in the poem, Much Madness is Divine Sense, we would use the word today insanity, not madness. Who are the insane people? Who are the sane people? Well, let's think about it this way. Who are the accepted people and who are the rejected people at Worland High School, for example? Notice what she says. Much madness, or follow it. Much madness, or uh, we might say the rejected people, is divinest sense. In, 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 you gotta be you gotta be crazy to be sane. To a discerning eye, you gotta look at it a certain way. Much sense, the starkest madness. Then look what she says. Who gets to decide whether you're crazy or sane? The majority. That's who gets to decide. In this is all prevail. Assent, agree with the populace, agree with the group, and you are sane, accepted. But if you demure or go against the majority or the populace, you're dangerous. You're handled with a chain. In other words, this will sound very much at 3A. This will sound very much like what Emerson said in his famous essay, Self-Reliance. An essay, by the way, Dickinson knew well. Okay, She was a voracious reader. She read all the time. Uh, she just didn't want to publish much of what she wrote, but she read a lot. I'd like to take a look at Success is Counted Sweetest as an example of Emily Dickinson's work. I'm with you now on 528. And I will spend now the majority of the rest of my time working specifically with this poem. I want to point out that as simple a poem as this is, it is a remarkable essay. And over the years of lecturing this poem, I have found especially students who are athletes to report to me this may be the single favorite poem of their entire high school career. Let's look at it and see if there's any reason why so many of my students will report at the end of our time together in May. We will, uh, I'll ask you this question, what of all the stuff you read is one of the things that you say you really would like to remember after high school? And it's interesting to me that this poem often has been recorded number one. Let's take a look at it. Success is counted sweetest 
by those who ne'er succeed. To comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. Not one of all the purple hosts who took the flag today can tell the definition so clear of victory as he defeated dying on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph burst agonized and clear. One of the reasons I love to teach Emily Dickinson is that when I finish reading this poem, often students will say to me, you might as well have stood in front of the room and gone, blah, 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 blah. that's about how much this poem meant to me. And yet once we begin the process of exegesis and we start to understand or unpack this poem, we begin to realize that even though it's a simple looking poem on the page, Dickinson is playing a very complex game. I want to begin by pointing out something for you in your annotations, starting at 2B, the rhetorical level. Not what she says, but how she says it. And I want to point out that Emily Dickinson is writing what we will call a very brief poetic essay, an essay. She's going to have a clearly stated thesis, and then she's going to provide us with two points of validation, just like we would do if we were writing an essay. Notice her thesis is stated in the first of the opening lines of the poem. Success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. Jot down it, level one. What do you think it is you just heard me read or you just read as you looked at this poem? Put it in your own words. Success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. Now again, the only possible vocab challenge here would be the word ne'er, which is just an abbreviation for what word? Never. Never. That's the only difficult word of these first two lines. And then I can tell some of you right now are struggling to put in your own words exactly what it is that you just read. So go back and look at it again. Success, winners or losers? Winners. Losers. Success, winners or losers? losers? Winners, right? Winners, success. Success is counted sweetest, good or bad? Good. good. Success is counted sweetest, winners understand winning by those who ne'er succeed. Don't say it, write it. Don't say it, write it. We're working annotative work here. Don't just say it, write it. Go back and look at it again. Success is counted sweetest by those who who ne'er succeed. Put it in your own words. What does she say about who understands winning? Winners or losers? Put it in your notes. Losers are the real understanders of winning. Not winners. Losers. What? Dude, wait a second. We are all together familiar with the concept of competition. You compete. There is a winner. There is a loser. The winner knows what it means to win. The loser knows what it means to lose. That we understand, guys. This is not rocket science until Emily Dickinson says, way wrong answer. You got it totally backwards. Winners don't know anything about winning. You want to know about winning, ask a loser. A loser will tell you about winning, not winners. Winners got no clue about winning. It's losers who understand what it means to win. That's her thesis. That's her thesis. Now the question is, how can you validate a view like that? We understand what winning is all about. Winning is for the people who win. We know what losers are. They're the guys who didn't win. Dickinson will say, way wrong answer. Winners don't have a clue what winning is all about. Losers are the ones that have a clue what winning is about. In fact, let's say it the way she says it, losers are the only ones that have a clue about winning. And that look that Ozzy has on his face like, dude, what are you saying is exactly the reason why she writes the poem. Let's say it out loud this way for your notes. Dickinson, in many of her poems, loves to play the game of paradox. What we will call in literature hyperbole. A hyperbole is two things that don't fit together. She says losers are the true, not necessarily winners, but they're the ones who understand winning. Winners don't understand winning. Losers understand winning. Then she will give us two points of validation to try to explain this. So before we try to explain it in our own words, let's take a look at how Dickinson validates it. Take a look. Her first point of validation. 
Notice she says, to comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. Read your sidebar, put it in your own words. We're working at level one. To comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. Now, the word comprehend here, notice that you have the, you have the number one at the very bottom of this poem to try and help you, right? What is it that she says? Well, think of it this way. Uh, you come into the classroom and you say, uh, Mr. McGee, I need to go get a drink. And I go, okay, go get a drink. You so you go to the water fountain, you come back, got your drink. That's one person. But what about if you'd been stuck in a room or you got locked up accidentally and for going on three days, you were stuck in that room without any water. In the third day, they discovered that you were there. Let's just say for point of argument that somehow or another, you end up locked in my enclave over the course of three days and nobody, and nobody knows and you go, man, I'm getting really thirsty and you run over to the sink that's in there and you turn it on and nothing comes out. And then you start banging on walls to get out and nobody hears you and into the third day finally, we let you out and you say to Mr. McGee, I need to go get a drink. Write down in your notes, what is the difference between those two students in regards to how they understand, appreciate, or comprehend the drink of water? The word here is appreciate. What's her word? Write it down and then, and then provide the word appreciate. She doesn't use the word appreciate. What word does she use, Mr. Mortimer? She uses comprehend. To comprehend a nectar, she doesn't use the word drink, she uses the word nectar, requires sorest need. Now put it in your own words. It isn't the people who want to get a drink who understand thirst. Then who is it? Put it in your own words. It's the people who have gone for days without drink. Those people understand. Would you agree with me? If you're locked up for three days and you got no water, and then all of a sudden somebody finally lets you out and you can get a drink of water, your understanding of water is going to be a little bit different from the normal person saying, I'm thirsty, I need a drink. Her first point of validation, it isn't winners that understand losing, or it isn't winners that understand winning, it's losers that understand winning. And her first point of validation is, think about people who are really thirsty versus people who are not thirsty but go get a drink anyway. The really thirsty person is the person who truly understands what? Write it down in your own notes. How would, how would you say it? The really thirsty person is really the person who understands what? What does the really thirsty person appreciate? What does the really hungry person appreciate? You even will hear coaches say this about a ball club. They were really hungry. Does that mean they were hoping that they got a good restaurant after the tournament. No! He's speaking metaphorically or she's talking in code language. Really hungry means what? See, this is the point Emily Dickinson's making. Ball players start to understand this poem. Oh. There are competitors and then there are starving competitors. Only one of the two understands competing. Only one of the two understands competing. That's POV1. Let's go to the second one. For the second one, and then I'll get to your observation, Mr. Card. For the second one, you've got to understand a word picture. It doesn't make any sense. Dickinson's writing this poem during the conflict in America that we call the American Civil War. Now, let me explain how they would fight these wars, these battles. I'm not making this up. I, I give this lecture every year, and students are like, You've got to be kidding me. I'm like, dude, I'm not kidding you. This is how they fought the wars, these battles. Everyone had a rifle. At the end of the rifle was a fairly long, what some of you would almost call a sword, but it actually was just a knife. It could be taken off, and of course we know of it as the bayonet, stuck to the front of the gun, if they still had one. A lot of them are already broken off. You would go into a field that would basically be kind of like the distance from this wall to that wall. Both sides would line up, facing each other. There would be 
then a series of shots. One side would shoot against the other side. But because of the way they shot, these kinds of rifles were what, or, or, or had to be filled one at a time with buckshot. You carried with you in a little pouch your little bullets. You couldn't carry very many of them because they're so heavy. You carried gunpowder and you carried a little bit of cloth. After you shot your rifle, you literally had to drop the next little bullet inside of the gun and stick down into the gun some gunpowder. Your gun was not going to go off again until you did this. So one side would shoot. The other side would shoot. And then you started refilling. They were just standing there. And then the other side would shoot. And then the other side would shoot back. Of course, if you ever shot a, a, a muzzle loader, a black powder rifle, the one thing that you know of is lots and lots of smoke. When it goes off, it expends lots of smoke. So if you put 500 men standing in lines shooting at each other, very quickly the smoke will fill the entire area. By the time you're shooting the third bullet, you do not see anything. You're not seeing it. You're just aiming at the general direction of where the other guys are. You shoot out all the bullets that you've got, and everyone else does too, and then you will run with your gun, and you will run at each other the way in football games today we do kickoffs, where you just they just run at each other. And in the middle of the field, because all the bullets were now gone, you then would go to hand-to-hand -hand combat, where you are basically just sticking people with your bayonet, hoping to kill them. The only problem is that by the time you shot off all of your weaponry, there's so much smoke in the air that a lot of times you didn't even know who you were stabbing. Death by being killed by your own teammates happened all the time you could end up killing people who actually were standing right there next to you. You got turned around, you got disoriented. The only way you could know whether the battle was won or lost, are you ready for this, was a flag. They had to have a pole that went way up in the air and a flag would sit at the top of the pole that referenced your side. So both sides had a flag. Right? The Confederacy had its Confederate flag. When the flag could not be seen, that meant the other side had lost. One guy, I'm not making this up, one guy's job was to stand in the line and hold the flag. He did not shoot the bullets. He held the flag. Had to hold it with two hands. Got me? And the other side would shoot, and he would hold the flag. If the other side ever shot the guy who was holding the flag and the flag fell, that meant that they were the winners. So as soon as the guy who was holding the flag got shot, someone had to drop his rifle, run over, pick up the flag, and hold it up. And of course, everybody would shoot at who? Who got shot at first in this arrangement? The guy holding the flag. Because once the flag went down, that was proof you were a loser. And the other team was the winner. And so you'd always kind of try. So finally, when the other side got close enough to steal the flag, wait a minute. From the time I was in elementary school, I played a kid's game called Capture the Flag. Oh, that's what we're referencing? That's what we're referencing. It was the most grotesque of battles in the American Civil War. The reason the flag had to be high in the air is because of all the smoke. So anytime you were in the battle, you would look up and try and see. If you could still see your flag, you knew you still had a chance. Once the flag fell and you couldn't see it anymore, it was over, and that would often lead to people running away. Of course, for those of you who actually read Red Badge of Courage, you're now aware of the moment in the story about him running away. Once you don't see the flag anymore, it's done, it's over. That is to say, there's nobody left alive to hold the flag up anymore. 
Now, if you don't understand that word picture, which, by the way, was just part of the culture of Emily Dickinson's day, if you don't understand that word picture, her final point of validation will make absolutely no sense for you. If you do understand that picture, this becomes a powerful, powerful word picture. Take a look at what she says. Not one of all the purple host who took the flag today, winners or losers? Winners. If you took the flag, you're the winner. Right? Not one of all the purple host who took the flag today can tell the definition so clear of victory as he defeated, dash, died, dash, on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph burst agonized and clear. What does she say? Let's put it in our own words for our annotations. She says there's this battle. It all begins by men walking literally out. You could see the other guy's face. That's how close you had to be. I literally mean from this wall to that wall. I literally mean you had to be that close. Because the weaponry they were shooting, not very, not very accurate. So you had to be close. So you literally could look and see the faces of the other people that you were shooting. The shooting would commence. The smoke. When all the bullets run out, it turns into that thing just like in a, a football game kickoff. Bam! Everybody's together. Now everybody's fighting hand-to-hand, -hand, stabbing, killing, trying to get what one thing the flag. When you finally captured the other flag, you knew you had won the battle. She says, two, battle, or two, two sides are fighting. She says, the way you know the winner is by who has the flag. But she says, the winning side who has the flag doesn't know anything about victory. Not like the other side. As he defeated Dying, lying in the mud, hearing the other side chanting, we're number one, we're number one. Right? Got the flag. Dickinson says, that's the person that understands victory. Not the winner, the loser. The one who in the final moments of his death, the last breath that he takes... He gets to hear the other side chanting, we're number one, we're number one, and then dies. Dickinson says, that's the person that understands victory. Not the person who won. Years ago, true story, I had given this lecture. And uh, it, was later in the, uh, it was later into the winter. And uh, at that time, we had... Uh, a uh, very interesting contest happening in the state of Wyoming in high school basketball. Worland had within its class what was considered to be the number one team in the state. Powell had what was considered to be the number one team in the state. When Powell and Worland had played in Worland, it had gone to overtime in a last second shot and Powell had won. When Worland had played in Powell, it had gone to a last second shot and well, and it won. As it came to the finals regionals to decide who would go to state, what would you know but the games were to be played in PAL? There was tremendous interest in this game, so much so that the band director of the day got a bus and put his entire band on the bus to go to that game that night. And it was in the old PAL gym. And uh, for those of us who showed up, uh, if you showed up an hour, uh, an, an hour early already, that gym was starting to, to fill up. So for those of us that showed up just a few minutes before tip-off, yeah, you're not, you're not getting much of a seat on that evening. The bands, both full bands, were in that gym playing. Okay, And there was supposed to be this rule about how one band was supposed to play and the other band was supposed to All those rules went out the window halfway through this game because this was a... Back and forth, all the way, back and forth. I mean, I don't think there was much of a lead change over like three or four points for the entire game. It was, uh, it, I, people stood the whole time. I got no reading done sitting there. I mean, it was loud in this gym. I mean, you, I, at one moment, I actually screamed to the person standing next to me, and he could not hear what I was saying. That's how loud it was at that gym. Just unbelievably loud. Wouldn't you know it, comes down to the last 10 seconds of the game, and Worland is down by one point. Oh. 
There's a timeout that's called, and later I would speak with a basketball coach who said, I was just screaming at my guys, and they, you could tell by their face, none of them could hear me. You could not hear us in this little tiny gym. And every one, I mean, it's like half of Warland showed up for this game, and all of Powell was there. I mean, this place was literally packed full, all the way out into, the, you know, into that little area outside of the gym, completely packed full. Even people that couldn't be watching the game because there was no place for them to watch. This is one of those high school moments in sport. They call the timeout. At seven seconds, Worland has the ball and inbounds. Almost throws the ball away. Five, four, three, two. It's what every kid who's ever played the game of basketball dreams about. The shot goes up, and I kid you not, it must have bounced on the rim four times. The clock goes out. Now, obviously, the significance of this game is this is a final game in the regional tournament. It will allow the winner to go to the state tournament then to be ranked number one, of course, and bragging rights and all of that. The ball bounces, 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 and there's this weird moment when the entire crowd goes like death silent. If I hadn't been there, I wouldn't be able to tell you this story in the same way. It was like, what's going to happen next? And then the ball goes through. And in that moment, I swear to you, it was the weirdest thing. The entire floor just vanishes. It's like gone. There's no floor. You can't see the wood floor anymore. The entire side of the Whirling fans are out onto the floor immediately. <laughs> the POW kids literally fall over. They're so exhausted, they played so hard, but they had lost. You know, it's like, ah. And uh, the next day was like a Monday, because this game happens on a Saturday night. The next day, uh, or Monday, uh, 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 one of my students comes in the room. He goes, oh, Mr. McGee, i got to tell you this weird story. I was like, uh, yeah, I was there. And he goes, no, 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 not that. It was afterwards. And I was like, you know, because he was, he was a starting point guard in this team. He goes, it's really weird, because we go into the locker room. And uh, he said, we're really excited. We're all like, jumping up and down. We're number one and all of that. And then he said, it hit me. Two things he said hit me. Uh, the first was that, in the old pal gym, the locker rooms shared a common wall. So, for example, on one side is the visitor's locker room, the other side is the, is the actual home locker room, right? And he said it hit me for a split second that right across the wall, that cement wall, couldn't have been that far, right across the wall, those pal guys are sitting in that locker room, and they're just, like, completely dejected, the way we would have been if we had missed that shot. And they had to be hearing us screaming, shouting, we're number one, we're number one, right through the, right? And then he said, the second thing was that I remember that lecture that you gave last week from that poem about the losers are the ones who understand winning. And he goes, for a split moment, I realized, whoa, those guys are like sitting in that locker room. The ball didn't go through for them. Uh, they, they, do they know what winning is like better than me? Because they lost? Ugh. And he said, for a split moment, I actually felt sorry for those guys. And then it went away, he said. And then I was really happy that we won. But he said, for just a moment, he said, that poem actually made sense to me. That in the experience of competition, it isn't the winners, it's the losers who understand competition. Well, there you go. Emily Dickinson, an introduction to her ideas. Success is counted sweetest. Thank you, and I hope that you're all losers. Uh, I mean winners.